long this fruit is. This can get to be five inches long, and it has a really unique kind of fig type flavor profile. Everybody. This is uh, Josh Jameson here at Cody Co Fruit Farm and Nursery and we're making a video today to show uh, some of the progress on our new farm to introduce um, what we've been up to for the last year and uh, show some of the unique crops that we're going to be offering for sale in the future. Um, some of you are probably may have seen me on YouTube before done tours of the Hart Village and I have been connected working at Heart for about 10 years and decided a few months ago to transition into uh, full-time being here on my own farm. So we're gonna be mainly uh, operating as a, a nursery where we ship plants and have customers come here in person to some degree. And then we're also planting a lot of tropical fruit and we'll have a lot of fruit for sale um, especially in a few years, but we're starting to already get some things. We're in Babson Park, Florida, and this property is really unique because um, we're surrounded by a really large deep lake called Crooked Lake, and we're right in this nook of the lake um, that makes this property kind of like driving south 100 miles. So all through this neighborhood, there's large mango trees and other tropical um, species of plants and fruit trees. And there's even uh, some mangoes that a neighbor speculates may have been planted in the late 1800s. So mango trees and other tropical plants have survived even the very hard freezes in this area. But um, it's really interesting because we're only about four miles from the Hart Village as the crow flies here. And last year, from the coldest place at Hart to this property, I measured a 12 degree difference. So last year, Hart had heavy frost and a freeze that had, you know, took things like papayas back to the ground. And over here, we didn't even have any frost. I had even like coconut trees sitting outside in pots that had no damage. So it's really uh, interesting. This is a really unique site also because we're in Florida, yet this property has a huge slope. I think it drops over 100 feet starting from the east down sloping west down to the lake over there which also contributes to us having a warmer microclimate because the cold air drains off down the hill and there's a recirculation of air that helps keep it warmer too. So it's really cool because we're, we're far away from uh, the kind of places where you'd be able to grow mangoes and jackfruits and sapodillas and all these kind of tropical fruits, but yet we're going to be able to pull that off here, which is proven right here, right behind me, there's a huge 30 foot mango tree, you know, showing us that these kind of species can do well here. Um, we have been on this property for one year. We, I think we signed for this house and this land on January 7th of last year. And today is something like January 15th of 2022. So this gives you a glimpse into what you could accomplish on a new property in one year um, if you really set your mind to it. Um, some people may feel like this is a, a lot to grow in one year, but bear in mind that I was working out here like almost like a full-time job for a lot of the year this year. Um, so not necessarily going to be achievable for somebody doing this as a hobby when they get home every night. But uh, be encouraged that in one year, you can really grow a lot of biomass and you can start to get a lot of production um, on certain species. And we, we're already harvesting fruit. So, um, and definitely we're harvesting vegetables and root crops and all kinds of those things. Um, so someday uh, we would like to invite people. You can come here. We have inf we're gonna have a website up in a few weeks where you can read about what it, you know, um, coming to visit, coming to buy from our nursery. And very soon we'll be having an online web store where you can mail order a lot of the plants that we grow here. And that'll be probably our main source of income on this farm. Um, so our focus is uh, collecting um, 
and growing out and making available really unique and elite genetics of edible food crops. So I kind of feel like there's a lot of places that sell edible plants, but there's not a lot of places that focus on really unique varieties of a lot of these perennial vegetables and other lesser known things. Um, and we're trying to fill that gap a little bit and we're trying to offer really high quality plants, really high quality cuttings and um, planting material to small growers, farmers, home gardeners, um, with the idea that um, making all these things available, locally adapted things is a huge step in transitioning us towards a more sustainable community in Florida where um, we have well adapted varieties that produce high quality food for that are selected and uh, you know chosen specifically for this part of the world. If you buy plants from nurseries that are from other states or even different parts of Florida, you may not have the same success as things that are selected specifically for here. But that's not to say that a lot of these things can't grow in other places too. It's just that we're specifically trying to identify things that have high potential for the community around us within a few hundred miles. A couple of those things are right here in front of us. This is one that I'm extremely excited about. This is a perennial uh, kale from Southern Africa. And unlike tree collards and tree kale that are in the nursery trade, these actually survive the summer here. And I'm over a year into cultivating this and it looks like the plants are going to make it for at least a few seasons. And the cool thing about this one is you can just clip a cutting and put it directly in the ground. Now the people I got this from were less excited maybe about the fact that it grows for several years and been more excited about the eating quality of it. So it's very tender, very good. We had this for dinner last night with some broth. It's a very mild, delicious type of kale. In fact, we think this tastes better than our, our kind of standby that we've always grown is like dinosaur kale. And this tastes even better. And you can just clip a piece off, harvest the leaves, and then stick a new cutting in the ground. Um, we had three varieties from the nursery trade of tree collards, tree kale. Those all died over the summer and all of the plants I had of this survived. This is just one example of something that we feel has a lot of potential. So this is called chamolia. And right behind us, this is the uh, Florida Finley onion. This is a perennial dividing onion that's a heirloom from this area that the gardener it came from, his grandparents had been cultivating this in Florida in photos like 50 or 60 years ago. So this is something that has a track record in our county of being a perennial vegetable that has stood the test of time. Um, so this one, it dies back in like May and then you harvest the bulbs and you store the bulbs until fall and then you plant them out again in the fall. And then in the meantime, you can divide, divide, divide and make more plants out of it. You can see here, it, it grows like a, a cluster um, and we could dig that up and make 10 new plants out of that one. And then off of those, 10 new plants off of that one. And you can use this like a green onion. And then when it starts to form, you know, thick stems and bulbs, you can cook those like an onion too. So this is another exciting one. We sold out of these in the past, so now we're trying to grow a lot of them to make them available to people. Something unique about our farm is we're, um, I think it's unique, is we're trying to not resell as much and just sell things that we don't know about. We're trying to, I want to, when I sell you a plant or give you a plant, I want to say with confidence, this does well, not out of an idea or head knowledge about it, but because I grow it myself and I eat it. If it doesn't taste good, if it doesn't grow well, I'm not going to try and, and sell it. I want to know from personal experience of growing and eating what these plants are all about. Um, so this is another one. This is called columnar basil. This is a perennial basil. I should say sort of perennial in that, you know, it, it goes for a year, 18 months, and then you kind of need to start new cuttings and move it along. But you can keep it going forever from new cuttings and it does not succumb to a lot of the diseases and issues that traditional sweet basils have. But unlike African blue basil, which is a common, that's kind of the old tried and true Florida perennial basil, this tastes a lot better than African blue basil. It tastes really good. It kind of has a cinnamony basil type flavor profile, but you can just make this into pesto or put it raw right on food. It's very good. And unlike African blue basil, it never flowers. It's some sort of like 
cross that is apparently sterile. It never flowers, so you never have nasty bolting heads that become undesirable to eat. It's kind of, all, as long as you're pruning it and watering it and taking care of it, it will kind of always have healthy new growth like this that's you know ready to just go on food. So we're really excited about this one. Um, we also have a mint that we've selected that's very well adapted to this area. So we're trying to hone in on some of these things that are, um, you know, very locally adapted. They taste really good and they grow well in this part of the state. Over here is our home garden. I didn't sit down with the permaculture design manual building this farm, but the ideas in there are just common sense. You put the most, um, you know, the most attention needing type of crops like annual crops right by your house. And then as you get further away, you move into fruit trees and forestry and those kind of, you know, lesser um, input types of growing systems. So here's chayote. This is a Honduran variety. There's not, uh, there's maybe, I just picked some, but there's not much on here right now. I think I need to increase the water. So I just added some more water to this but this is a very productive variety for us typically um k took more of a common type thing and then around the house we have bananas and flowers and you know different things that are beautiful and functional we put things close to the house that we're going to pick a lot like the, the k took greens and the herbs and the annual vegetables this is a mulberry that I'm really excited about. Um, this is something that's not in the nursery trade or at, um, really nobody has in Florida um, other than a handful of people. This variety of mulberry is called Skinner and see the, the, how long this fruit is. This can get to be five inches long and it has a really unique kind of fig type flavor profile. Um, this is not the same as Himalayan or Pakistan. This is a unique variety that the um, fruit collector, who's now quite elderly, Crafton Clift, brought this from Trinidad. And a man named Dr. Skinner had brought it from Australia to Trinidad. So that's its kind of journey. And it's basically just been hiding in a guy's backyard for the last 20 years that Crafton had grafted it on this guy's tree. And to my knowledge, there's really not any other trees of it. So I made a special trip down there to Miami and went to the guy's yard and got these cuttings, brought them back and was able to propagate it. And now we're growing it out and it's, it's producing and we're going to be working hard to make this available um, because of it's just, it's really a huge fruit. It's got a unique flavor and we're also working to collect some of the other long fruited types of mulberry like Himalayan, different types of Pakistan mulberries. Um, mulberry is something that we really think is a great fruit crop. Um, also for growers or gardeners that are in really cold parts of Florida, mulberry is something that can tolerate um, any amount of cold that you can get in Florida. Um, and just a very delicious berry. We're also trying to identify some of the mulberries that are very firm so that they can be picked and then packed into a clamshell and marketed. So we have a few varieties that are from Southeast Asia that are more like that. The flavor on those is not as rich as some of the others, but the fact that you can handle them without them breaking is a unique trait that's really valuable. Uh, this is something that might surprise people. This is asparagus. I originally got this asparagus from a grower in Naples and on that property in Naples, the grower has all kinds of quite tropical species, even a breadfruit tree that was 10 or 15 years old. So the uh, conventional wisdom is that asparagus needs cold every year to survive in the long term. Uh, but he had been growing this asparagus for like 20 years and he had sourced it out of Hawaii. So um, these are all seedlings and some of them are doing better than others. So what I'll probably do is I'll clone the, the strongest seedlings and maybe we'll name that clone if this success continues and we'll scale that up and we may have a kind of Central Florida adapted asparagus to offer in the future. Um, they've done quite well, actually, which is kind of surprising. Um, but they're in dappled shade and they do get watered. So those are, you know, important factors. This is another one 
Uh, it's the middle of the winter right now. So even though it looks pretty green, it's actually, everything's a little bit uh, kind of subdued right now from the cooler winter temperatures. Um, but this is a special variety of chaya that grows really big leaves. This is a special selection from uh, Mexico um, that is really not, this isn't out um, to people. The shot right here is probably not showing its potential. Here you can see how large these leaves can really get. I measured leaves that were like 15 inches wide. This is a lot larger than the more common varieties that are around. And um, this, you know, tastes about the same. It's very tender as the other chaya. It just produces giant leaves. We do offer this for sale online. And people on this variety, uh, my neighbor even, he like breaks, when it's an active growth, he breaks these big fat shoots off and cooks them like broccoli. Uh, again, just in one year, it's pretty impressive what you can do. These came out of one gallon pots less than a year ago and you already have this much production. And then these are gonna produce for 30 years. So this type of perennial gardening is, you know, this is very low maintenance. I basically have just mowed around this since I planted and watered. One of our main crops right now on the farm is papaya. Again, remember, this is less than a year old. Um, papaya is really, really fast at producing a large volume of fruit. We probably have 50 trees on the farm. Well, they're really not trees. You know, we have 50 papaya plants on the farm. And in one year, you know, you can have this kind of production. Some of our trees are having some issues with this. It's some sort of fungal issue that seems to mostly be a problem in the winter time. And we also have uh, the fruit papaya fruit flies that get into them here. But despite having that fruit fly, we still get really good fruit set. And not every time the fly stings the fruit, it's successful. So we have some premature fruit drop, but we're actually getting a lot of good, fully ripe fruit out of here, even with high um, fruit fly issues. And I do patrol the ground and I, I harvest out stuff that is infected and I take it to the chickens so they eat the larva and as much as I can I can control the um, the cycle of that fruit fly so um, we do have papaya fruit we're starting to sell a little bit um, just one of the best uh, species for a home garden for a small farm because in one year you're rolling in production you can eat them green as a vegetable which we love one of the best vegetables out there really is shredded green papaya salads or cooked into curries and soups and stuff when it's just got a slightest blush of color maybe like this one you can chop it up and it's just like a carrot stick and then of course it ripens up into be a sweet marketable fruit these are uh fishtail palms which a lot of people probably know from landscaping but in northern thailand the um heart of palm is a really important vegetable so this is just kind of a fun ornamental that eventually also will harvest um, I did have a friend who had lived in Thailand show me, we cooked some up together, and it's a, it's a really actually delicious vegetable. This is Cecropia, fruiting Cecropia, kind of an oddball fruit tree. It's a big tropical looking thing that makes these long fruits that are actually kind of, they're kind of like a fig. Uh, these are bananas, so uh, we went heavy on planting bananas in our first year because again, they're like papaya in that in a short amount of time, you can have this kind of biomass. Um, I should mention that most of what we're gonna look at from here out was weed tree forest that I cleared pretty much by hand. Um, Albizia, um, cherry laurel, Suriname cherries, all kinds of like junky weedy type trees. So we've thinned the forest, we've left 30 some percent of canopy over this whole area, but um, we slashed up and kept as much of the biomass as possible. Some of it we burned to make biochar to enrich the soil. And um, by leaving some of this canopy, if we do have some cold nights, it'll help. It helps break up the wind. It helps, you know, um, it helps with the soil. It's just a generally beneficial thing in our case to leave some canopy. Um, this is two different varieties of bananas. We're growing bananas as a fruit crop, but also our goal is to sell um, pups of named varieties. So we have right here a row of uh, dwarf namwa, which is a 
um, productive variety for Central Florida. They don't mind cool weather. All the varieties here we're trying to grow are mostly tolerant of cool weather. Some of them, some varieties of banana, when you get into the 40s even, they start to get beat up. They can, they can, you can even get damaged getting into high 30s, like Cavendish is one that just does not like our conditions. Dwarf Namwa does really well. It has thick leaves. It's pretty tolerant of wind, of poor soil, of all the things that happen here. And it's a delicious kind of sub-acid fruit that has a really unique flavor. This variety is um, called SH3640. This is a variety out of the um, Honduran FIA breeding program. There was a big, there's a big USDA breeding program to develop new commercial cultivars called FIA. So that's where you get varieties like Goldfinger, Mona Lisa, Sweetheart, and others. This one's called SH3640. Um, apparently it was specifically selected with nematode tolerance in mind. It's a big, sturdy commercial variety. It makes very few pups. You get one big tree-like pseudo stem, and then it can make huge 50, 60 pound bunches of fruit. It's a very, very productive variety. Um, and also tolerant of cool weather, tolerant of nematodes, tolerant of all of our kind of growing conditions. These are the two varieties that I put the most of, and then I probably have 15 or something other kinds interspersed throughout the um, agroforestry garden. Um, this one's flavor is more like a grocery store banana with maybe a little bit of that sub-acid. Um, people seem to really like the flavor of this. I mean, I, I like it. Um, I like these bananas for different things. This is really Dwarf Namwa is a dessert banana I like better, but to make smoothies and use like a more traditional grocery store banana, I like bananas like this SH3640 or Goldfinger or ones that have that more classic grocery store type flavor. Back behind us, there's a row of uh, five star fruits, a very productive crop for this area. And they're kind of unique that they can fruit really well with some shade. So there's an overstory of Peltiforum and albizia which are legume trees and we thinned a lot of the canopy and then we have a row of star fruits we're planting a lot of rare unique um, species and varieties um, these bananas here are goldfinger and oh, i'm sorry this is actually tall namwa which is like a dwarf namwa but it grows taller and uh goldfinger back here we have a uh, sweetheart banana probably crazy but I am planting coconuts kind of around if they you know you never know um, this is a really protected farm so maybe probably in 10 years they'll within 10 years they'll all get wiped out by cold but you gotta at least try this is a very special one of the more special unique um, fruit trees we have on this farm this is a ficus so it's a fig relative Ficus auriculata. Ficus auriculata is relatively common at botanical gardens and in nurseries as an ornamental. But the ones that are out there in the nurseries and stuff, they produce a fig, but then it doesn't have the proper wasp to be pollinated, so they fall off when they're green and they never ripen to be a fruit. Um, David Fairchild wrote about this fruit like 100 years ago when he was traveling in the Himalayas and about what a delicious fruit this was. And he even brought it back to Florida. And then that same variety that fruited well in Asia, when he brought it here, the fruit would not ripen because of the lack of the proper wasp pollination. This one, somebody went again to replace a tree that had been killed in a hurricane. The new one they brought back happened to be Parthenocarpic, meaning that it ripens fruit properly without pollination. So what that means is this is a, a fig relative it will produce big figs that are sweet and good. I mean, I'm speaking out of other people's reviews. I haven't tasted it yet, but big, nice figs right on the trunk of the tree. And this is a beautiful, big, tropical looking ornamental ficus. And apparently this has some degree of cold tolerance. A lot of reviews online, people in Texas and different parts of Florida seem to have this growing in landscaping. It might take some cold damage, but it's not as cold sensitive as it might appear. I have another very special ficus over there that's the same story. It is a parthenocarpic type of 
ficus called ficus sycamorus, which is um, another one I made a special trip to Naples to go collect the cuttings. And that one is the fig that it talks about in the Bible when Zacchaeus climbs a sycamore tree. It's talking about ficus sycamorus. And this, it's one of the oldest cultivated fruit trees in the world, same deal. The normal types of it don't fruit here, but there's a special variety that doesn't need pollinated by a wasp. And we have that here too. So that these are two things that, two very special tropical fruits that we are gonna be working hard to propagate in the next few years. Um, the bananas here are actually my neighbors. He's into the same kind of stuff we are here. And he's got a great garden next door. So you should do a video of another day. Um, but along the property line, we put jackfruits. So I'm planning to have a total of probably 40 or 50 jackfruits on the farm. These are all seedlings. So that's a seedling from a grocery store fruit out of Mexico that was good and sweet. This is a Borneo red seedling, NS1 seedlings, and then J29 seedlings, which is a great red fleshed uh, Malaysian cultivar. So ones that taste bad, we'll cut down. Ones that don't produce, we'll cut down. And the ones that are good, we'll stick with. Seems like a lot of people have good success with um, seedling jackfruits. So hopefully in a couple of years, we'll get to start tasting some of these and evaluating these different seedlings. And I may plant some grafted ones also. Here you see kind of an agroforestry type system where there's sweet potato as a ground cover all underneath of the uh, jackfruit. And so I, I sell sweet potato cuttings. And this is a market crop for me. And I will eat all the potatoes. And then also it's doing a pretty good job at suppressing the weeds. I do want to talk a second about this sweet potato. Uh, when I worked at Hart, I got this thing in me to, to evaluate sweet potato varieties. And I did a trial of 35, 40 kinds of sweet potato over two years. And out of that trial, I selected this variety as our very best one in the trial. It outperformed everything two years in a row by a wide margin. Like in the first trial, it was like double the next, you know, closest one. And what was really interesting is that some of the varieties, by the day we harvested them, had nothing. So, um, great variety. It's called Tainung 64. And we're trying to promote this. Home gardeners, small farms, and others will do really well in Central Florida with this variety. It was bred in Taiwan at a similar latitude to here. It seems to tolerate all the various things that Florida has to throw at it. It can even be productive under relatively dry conditions. We've been eating a lot of this out of here. I just plugged them in all through the garden all over the place. Um, and we do sell right now on eBay, but we'll have these listed on our website. We sell uh, cuttings about this long for, we sell them for like a little more than a dollar a cutting. And if you've had, I, I did that trial because I had a hard time growing good sweet potato year after year. I was just getting mixed results with random varieties out of catalogs and stuff. After switching to this, we're like consistent. We plant sweet potato, we get a lot of sweet potato to eat. It's a good orange flesh variety, delicious, all around, great variety for Florida. It's called Tainung 64. This is uh, one of the most rare special things I have on this farm. This is a relative of Chayote called Takako. It's Sikium Takako, native to Costa Rica. That's really the only place where this is known. It looks like a little Chayote, but it has kind of a hard shell on it. In Costa Rica, they seem to cook it, and then you pull it out of the food and split it open and eat the inside, and they seem to like dipping it in mayonnaise. I have no idea how this will do here. I may be the, one of the only people in Florida growing this or has ever tried growing this because it's a really obscure thing. Uh, but I'm very excited about the potential of this one. Really, there's not a lot of information online about this at all. Uh, a lot of the information's in Spanish and even that's kind of sparse. So we'll find out soon if that's... Uh, weird thing about this, they took like nine months to sprout where a chayote will sprout right on the vine. All right, so right here is a uh, passion fruit that, again, I'm really excited about this. This is a really large fruited special variety of passion fruit from Brazil. I don't know if you can see the fruit here. They're really large. And 
Um, I hand pollinate these when they're in bloom. I, I made this trellis. There's old tree stumps with uh, telephone wire that the telephone company left laying in the woods. I stretched that out amongst the tree stumps and planted four seedlings of this. Um, great variety from Brazil, huge fruit. And if you hand pollinate it, they're so heavy. Each fruit feels like a softball in your hand. And we've just started to get the first few ripe fruits. Very, very, very delicious passion fruit. You cut it in half and it's full of juice. And we measured and we got almost a half cup of pure juice just out of one fruit. So if you compare that to the more typical purple ones where you get like a little spoonful out of, I mean, this is really worth your time, in my opinion, to hand pollinate. It's very easy. You just take the pollen from one vine, then you go to a different vine. You start on the other end. So what I would do, I'd go to a flower here. I walk down 20 feet away to the end of the row, and then I just walk back this direction and I just grab them all. In the afternoon is when they seem to be most receptive. Walk through, pollinate them all, and most of the ones that you touch will um, result in a fruit. So hiding all through here are lots and lots of these um, fruits. I'm probably going to sell fruit. Um, I might, I'm thinking of shipping one or two fruits in a little box so that a customer can taste and eat and then they can save the seed and plant rather than just shipping you seeds. You can get to experience the quality of the fruit also. Um, these I started from seed only one year ago and they're already in production. So this is a great example of something like a banana or a papaya that can fill in space in the short term while you're waiting for more long-term trees to take over. So on the other side of this trellis is all my jackfruits and then there's a row of fruit trees here. And eventually these are gonna crowd together and there will just be a walking path where this passion fruit is. By that time, these will be done. They're not a long lived plant, a couple years. These will all be done. We'll clean all this up and this will be a walking path and the jackfruits and the other trees will start to grow in where these were. But why would you, as a small farmer, I, why would I waste a bunch of open space for the first three years and just wait for the jackfruit to grow when I could be making um, an income or getting production out of the space in between the rows? But the pro like on a commercial farm where everything is with tractors and mowers, it's hard to have this level of um, space efficiency because you can't get machinery through here. This is much more like a Central American coffee farm where I weed whack the weeds, I cut things with machetes, and it's hard to scale this up maybe in the US, but um, we're able to do this at a small scale to grow in this way. This is another one of our kind of unique, rare fruits that I'm excited about. This is called Rucum. It's related to Governor's Plum, but um, Governor's Plum is like a little uh, fruit like this big that tastes like a plum, but this has an edge on Governor's Plum, and I don't know why Governor's Plum got popular and this didn't. Um, this is only found in a couple gardens. It's hardly known. Governor's Plum is filled with thorns that will pop a tire or puncture your shoe or put your eye out. Horrible thorns. Um, the fruit tends to be astringent, so it dries your mouth out a little bit when you eat it. This is thornless. It's not astringent. It just tastes like a delicious little plum. Um, on top of that, I was shocked at heart. I had a tree that's half Governor Plum and half Rucum that I grafted onto the Governor Plum. And last year when we had a cold event, the Governor Plum defoliated and died back and this didn't. I was very surprised, but this is actually more, more cold tolerant than Governor Plum, which I don't know why, but um, that's a really interesting fruit. This hasn't fruited yet. Once it fruits and I determine that around here, this is a viable fruit crop, I'll start air layering these and selling small trees. This is a very interesting palm tree um, called Euterpe edulis. So this is like a type of acai palm. Acai is the, the, um, the Brazilian superfood, you know, the purple fruit that's full of antioxidants. You could buy the acai bowls and all the fancy granola bars and stuff. That, that tree is very, very tropical. It only grows in typically kind of swampy, wet areas for the most part, and it really likes um, 
like fully tropical, hot, humid conditions year round. This, that's, so uh, Euterpe oleracea, I believe, is the true acai. This is Euterpe edulis. This is native to Southern Brazil. Now, Southern Brazil is very similar to Florida. If you look at the types of plants that grow in Southern Brazil, a lot of them overlap with Florida. Jabotacaba, Suriname cherry, jelly palm, um, those kinds of things are more subtropical. They grow well in Florida. That's where this is native to. Unlike acai, this only makes one trunk. Acai makes multiple trunks. But this is like an emergent palm. It grows in shade and then pops out up through the canopy and produces big clusters of fruit that are supposed to be basically indistinguishable from acai. So this could be the beginnings of like an acai industry in central or south florida which is it's a really interesting thing i don't know why more people aren't working with it because it's also grown on a small commercial scale in southern brazil it's not like a wild plant it's something that people actually cultivate as a crop um very interesting potential with that this is a banana variety i got from a guy's house that had passed away it had been growing on his property for many years and he thought it was a great banana variety. Uh, the man's name was Lloyd Marsh. Um, it's Fort Myers area. He called it apple banana, but you know, it really could be anything. But of all the varieties here, this has been one of the sturdiest, fastest growing, healthy looking plants. As winter has come on and we've gotten some cooler nights, it hasn't blinked at all. Some of the varieties get some older leaves, get yellow, they shut down. This has been really, really sturdy, healthy. You can see how tall it is and just, I might have planted this in March or something. It's not even a year. Haven't tasted the fruit yet, but um, it's supposed to be very good. I have a couple of those here. These are West African yams. They're growing up a Peltiforum legum tree way up there. This is a delicious yam. I tried a lot of different varieties of West African yam and finally got one that produces well. It's a very smooth, nice yam and high eating quality. Unlike the wild yams or the ones that are on the invasive species list that people are familiar with, this does not produce bulbs in the air. This is not on the invasive species list and it has no chance of ever naturalizing somewhere where you don't plant it for a number of reasons that are too detailed to get into in this video. But this is gonna stay put where you plant it. Not only that, the tubers are beautiful, smooth, easy to peel, and the flesh is dense and tasty like a potato. This is something we're gonna be offering soon also. Very, very high quality yam variety for gardens, especially for people that don't wanna venture into those ones that run a little bit too rampant and make the bulbs that sprout everywhere. This is a grafted Suriname cherry. This is a yellow yam that we're evaluating. Actually seems to be a big tuber popping up right here. Yellow fleshed yam, like it's popular in Jamaica and West Africa. So what uh, TJ is standing under here is another really special thing that I worked very hard to bring into production. This is tamarillo, tree tomato. A fruit that's not grown in Florida really anywhere because this is more of a highland species. It likes the cool, like 5,000 feet elevation where you might see things like uh, even plums or peaches growing in the tropics where you might run into uh, kind of like cloud forest, cooler type conditions. But what I think people missed over the years is that this plant is very, very sensitive to nematodes. So on its own roots, you plant it in the ground and then a couple months later, it looks like it's drought stressed and then slowly the heat and the humidity and everything just beats up on it and it dies. I learned from another grower that you could graft this to Solanum macranthum, a related ornamental species, and then you get plants that grow here. And I, at heart, this is fruited, so we know it can fruit here south americans watching this video may be very excited to find out that you can grow tamarillo in florida the thing is key is that it has to be grafted it needs a good supply of water good soil and also a little bit of shade seems to be beneficial this is on the north side of a big palm tree and some other vegetation that keeps it in a little more shade 
to keep it closer to that highland type situation. It does not fruit, it does not grow well in full shade, I can say. Uh, but this is only, uh, you know, nine months old in the ground and we should be getting flowers soon. Very exciting. I'm evaluating some different types of Tamarillo too to see which one is the best suited um, for this area. More papayas, uh, hog plum or hocote. This is Manzano banana. This is supposed to be the true apple banana, but I think that apple bananas are probably a lot of different things. Um, so don't really know. Um, we're trying to evaluate different guavas to see which guavas do best here. This is a uh, Thai purple guava. We have uh, Peruvian white. They all sound like some sort of crazy drug, <laughs> the names. Um, and then we have uh, another one called Kilo. Here's another one. I keep saying this, but this is something that I'm really excited about. Um, this is a Chayote from Guatemala that I've been after for probably five years when I first read about it. Heard about it from Guatemalan people. It's called, in Guatemala, they call chayote whisquil. So this is whisquil de papa, the potato chayote. It's setting its first fruits here. I got this a couple years ago and I killed it. And then I got it again and finally succeeded at growing this. I planted it in a, uh, a depression that was already here. There was some, some there was some like concrete residue in the bottom. I don't know what was going on there, but chayote, contrary to popular belief, is a very thirsty plant. This property sits a hundred feet above the water table or something, so we don't have flooding. If your garden has high water table or standing water, totally discard everything I'm saying because it can't tolerate those conditions. But in a dry property, you're more likely to have issues with chayote from lack of water. So I water this plant very well with overhead water and it's rewarding us with, if I don't know if you can see up there, but it's climbed way up that queen palm. There's like a 25 foot queen palm there that's totally draped in vines. It's blooming heavily and there's now dozens of fruit all over it. The whole idea of this chayote, which by the way, um, was brought in uh, legally um, by a friend of mine from Guatemala and um, this produces a fruit that's starchier in richer in flavor than a typical chayote. Where it's from in Guatemala, this is a highly cherished type of um, chayote. People will prefer this to other kinds. Um, and we cooked some up last night for the first time and it truly did cook up starchier. The outside kind of browned like a potato and to me it, it had a potato-like quality. I'm not gonna say it's like eating a potato, but if you pan fry this and say you were diabetic, you could probably eat this and get the sensation of eating a potato. So it's a really special variety. It's very productive. I've had some chayotes that don't like to fruit well in this part of the state. I'm very excited that this one is doing well. It's productive. It's only downside is it seems to bloom a little bit later than some of the other ones, meaning in a property with if it gets a lot of early frost, this is probably not going to be your best bet. Totally worth trying, though, all through the state. Um, very special, and I'm, this is one that I'm very excited is, is finally producing. Um, another one of the acai. Uh, this is a ficus. Um, this is called ficus opposita. This is one of the ficus we're trying as a rootstock for figs to resist nematodes. We also have a fig right there grafted on ficus sycamoris. These are two ficus species that can grow without getting nematodes. If you have a fig tree in your garden and it languishes, probably nematodes destroying the roots. It's very, very sensitive to nematodes, which is why you see them languishing in most places. However, if you graft it to these resistant root stalks, you can have a tree that does great. There's now some examples of fig trees that are 20 plus years old that are getting to be big, full-size fig trees like you would see in California, here in Florida, um, grafted to these kind of rootstocks. So we have um, Craft and Clift is one of the people we have to thank for making these available and informing people about them. Again, Craft is this older 
fruit guy that I owe a lot to teaching, teaching a lot and he shared a lot of knowledge and plants with a lot of people. Um, we do have a collection of cassava varieties. This is one called CMC 40. It's a Brazilian variety that's very productive. Um, that one is called Cuban white. The flesh of it um, is white on the outside. The bark is white. Down there is one that um, I named agroforestry because it grows straight up. It grows like in nine months, the thing is like 12 feet tall, um, but it can kind of go up and be less competitive with surrounding fruit trees that some of the types grow wider. There's another type of cassava here called Togo. This is a West African variety. It's one of our top tier varieties. Very good tasting, never gets bitter. The cassavas that I'm most excited about now are two new varieties I have that are yellow. One is from Brazil, one is from India. They're both yellow flesh. So when you cook them up, the root is super yellow, probably high in vitamin A, and they taste really, really good, even better than Togo. They taste like an Irish potato. They cook so fast, if you're not careful, they just cook down into mush because they're so soft. The smell coming out of the pot is like an Irish potato. Super good. The one is from Brazil, it translates to butter. I don't know how to pronounce Portuguese well, but it's called Mantiega or Manteca. Brazilian. Maha Chinook mango. This is a Thai mango. It's kind of like a non Mai mango. Somebody's probably gonna comment and tell me and I'm an idiot for saying that, but that's my impression of it. Um, we're planting a mango production area this year Way down the slope, we're probably gonna put in like a half acre or an acre of mango. And most of the trees are gonna be different from each other. The goal is to sell mixed boxes of fruit. They'll all be labeled with descriptions. So you can buy a box of mangoes and taste all the mango flavors of the world. Thai, Indian, you know, the um, Caribbean type mangoes, spicy ones, ultra sweet ones, ones with wild and crazy flavors. Um, we want to demonstrate the big diversity that exists within mango. To me, the best uh, fruit in the world is a really good mango. This was another very forested area of the farm where I cleared and now we're putting in tropical fruit. So you can see all the biomass on the ground. This is a great system for growing. I don't consider this deforestation because we took out kind of junky trees and then we immediately are rolling into trees. All the organic matter has been preserved and this will be a forest again in a couple years. And in the meantime, we're covering the ground with things like quick growing things like banana, sweet potato. Um, and then this will be a forest of, there's three types of ice cream bean or inga. There's a row of black sapote here. This is a kind of rare fruit called kwai mak. It's related to jackfruit. This is a banana called ibon musak. Um, it ripens, it's totally green when it's ripe. I don't know much about it beyond that. Very impressed with this banana. This is called um, Puerto Rican Dwarf Plantain. So I guess it's more like a plantain. Haven't eaten it yet, but the plant, you can see it's held healthy foliage all the way down. Very stout, very large, healthy leaves. Haven't seen the fruit production yet, but this is looking to be like, um, this is something that I'm excited about. I also like that it seems like it's only going to be 10 feet tall or 8 feet tall before it produces. Some of these taller ones can get a little bit less manageable to deal with. Right over here I have my sore banana. That's supposed to get like 18 feet tall and then it sets fruit and snaps over before you can get to it. This is another variety of chaya, another lesser known one. We have Marabou Thomas to thank for this one. Also a bigger leaf type. Very nice. More bananas. That's a giant, supposedly good one from Tampa. There's Kandarian. I have Sabah. We have a uh, banana here called Super Dwarf Plantain. Super Plantain. I don't remember what it's called. Actually, Rajapuri banana. Um, this fruit's called Achacharu. This is a South American fruit that is like the closest thing we can grow to a mangosteen in Florida. Not quite as good as a mangosteen, but they're really good. And uh, it's just kind of a small Garcinia fruit with a thick rind and you eat it just like you would a mangosteen. 
That one is a little on the line here, but we're hoping we can pull that off. I'm probably gonna plant more of those in a few locations and hope that I can root that one. Boxapotes. Again, notice the kind of agroforestry scheme. There's bananas and other short-term things. Like even these figs are just here to pull cuttings from in the meantime, and eventually these black sapotes are gonna fill in and there won't be any room left for the bananas and figs. It's like an agroforestry type scheme. You grow things in the short term, harvest them, use them, sell them, and then in the long term, the big woody trees are the dominant uh, thing in the landscape. Um, so there's some more tropical fruit here. Again, coconut, you know, who knows. Uh, Ross sapote, which is like a canistel, but round and supposedly, I haven't eaten it, but supposedly very good. Kaimito, uh, grafted kaimito, another one that uh, is a little on the margin for this area, but I have it in a protected location. Um, now this is an interesting fruit. This I haven't eaten. I can't speak much to it. It's native to Brazil. And I might be saying the name wrong, but it's like Jua Asu, um, J-U-A-A-C-U. I have this grafted to a different type of rootstock. And this is supposed to be like a Naranjia fruit that loves our climate. It tolerates the like hot, humid summers that we get. Nice fruit set. You need two for pollinations. These are two different seedlings. There's pretty good fruit set on here. Very thorny shrub and I can't speak to it other than that. The guy who brought this into popularity in Brazil says it's like a nice uh, juice type fruit. So we'll see. We do have, uh, we do have chickens on the farm here, which are mostly for our own consumption. They're useful though, in that we can toss them uh, contaminated papayas that are filled with fruit flies and other you know fruit fall and stuff and they clean up for us and then also we do get some fertilizer for the fruit trees out of there we left a lot of the tree cover in their run so that they can hide from hawks and other predators which our neighbor was having hawks come in and grab all his chickens this is my big coconut i started with a big plant, it was like a hundred bucks from South Florida, hoping that um, if I had a tree that was already big enough, it already been through its first winter or two in a pot in South Florida, that maybe it'll be big enough now to get over the, the cold. And then it's sandwiched up here in between the house and some oak canopy in the part of the farm that last year during the winter tracked as the warmest of anywhere on the farm. So if, <laughs> If anyone in Polk County is gonna fruit a coconut, this spot right here is a pretty good uh, shot. So let's hope that that let's hope that that works. Even if it makes a few and then dies, I'll be happy to have just fruited coconut this far north. So this is our new greenhouse. Uh, I've been working on building this for the last month or so. Um, this is where we're gonna grow plants that we sell. And uh, we're, we're, we're in the next few weeks after I'm done in here, we'll come in and we'll get our certification and we'll get all set up to do this properly and ship plants. Um, so the, this greenhouse might interest some people. I priced out from some places like a proper greenhouse frame and for the square footage I wanted, which is like 20 by 65, it was like eight grand. And I was like, ah, no, I can build something a lot cheaper than that. So I designed this just out of material from hardware store and the flea market and stuff. Um, the design is like, uh, the main architecture of it is top rail fencing, inch and three eighths top rail fencing. And um, then the fittings holding it all together are like canopy tent fittings. So I'm not saying this is gonna be as durable and long lasting as a $8,000 greenhouse, but we were able to build this frame for less than a thousand. 
So at one eighth the price, uh, I think it'll come out in our favor that this is the way to go. If people are interested, you could always come here and pick up some plants or something and see how this is put together because this is a very affordable way to build a greenhouse. Um, and then there's some telephone wire and some other things rigged up to help with the stability. These poles are driven five feet into the ground, so they're really well anchored. And so far it seems very sturdy. Um, it's like, again, 20 by 65, I think. Right now, this is just full of uh, different trees that are gonna go out onto the farm this year. All kinds of different tropical fruit and stuff. Mango, loquat, achachuru, jujubes, mulberry, abiu, avocado, jackfruit, fig, everything like that. But soon this will be filled up with plants that we're selling to the community. So keep an eye out. Our website should be up and running soon. Our web store will be up and we'll also be open in the future to um, by appointment only nursery visits um, where people can buy uh, some of this stuff. And also don't forget the Heart Village Nursery is still running. They have a lot of great stuff. Hopefully we'll kind of have different things so that uh, we can both do this. Um, so always check out the Heart Village Nursery too for a lot of the more common perennial vegetables like chaya and katuk and those sorts of things. Check out our website. We'll be up soon at codycofarm.com. And also we'd love to have you sometime if you want to swing by and buy produce or plants, we'll be open for that in the near future. And thank you for checking this video out. And I hope this was uh, informative and helpful for people.